Testing, there we are. Good morning. morning. Welcome to Beverly Heights Church in the matchless name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like to personally acknowledge that this is the first Sunday that we're gathering for worship without Pastor Nate Devlin. And having said that, I also wanted to say that on behalf of the elders at Beverly Heights Church, we care very deeply about Sunday worship. We care very deeply about our congregation who gathers to worship on Sunday. So having said that, I wanted to let you know that we are going to continue in our series that Pastor Nate started, which is that we may be one. And we will be asking Peter, Chase, and Kyle, and Mark, and others to continue that throughout the coming weeks. And now I'd last like to ask you to greet one another in the name of the Lord. Please feel free to do that for the next few moments. Thank you. to also greet you and welcome you here to Beverly Heights Church this morning. And I do want to highlight a few things for you. I invite you to pick up a copy of Gathered Seeds that has all of our prayer requests and announcements in it. You can find the Gathered Seeds at the back entrances or in the hallway here next to the water fountain. And I wanted to point out a few things to you. First of all, Wednesday Night Heights will be taking place this week. It's a favorite tortellini soup this week for dinner. Uh, If you'd like to join us for dinner on Wednesday at 545, uh, we invite you to make a reservation by filling out the form that Jen sent out late last week, or by calling the church office on Tuesday, and we'll make a reservation for you in that way as well. And then we have a call from the session for a special meeting of the congregation. The session of Beverly Heights Church hereby calls for a special meeting of the congregation immediately following the conclusion of the worship service on Sunday, October 29th in the sanctuary of Beverly Heights Church for the following purposes. Number one, for Beverly Heights Session to present their decision to seek dismissal from the Evangelical Presbyterian Church into independence as the first of two congregational meetings required by the EPC Book of Government 510. And number two, for the Administrative Commission to address its September 16th report to the Presbytery and respond to questions from the congregation. Thank you. At this time, I invite you to prepare your hearts and minds for worship.
please join me in the invitation to worship printed in the bulletin. Lord Jesus Christ, make us one. Gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we come into your sanctuary today to worship you. Gather our hearts as we have gathered here today and grant us that we may remain pure in obedience to your word. Receive from us the glory that is due your name as we humbly approach you in prayer and praise. Bind our hearts to you. Bind our hearts to one another. Teach us your way that we may know your truth, O Lord. Unite our hearts to fear your name. We pray for your presence and your mercy and your grace. We pray that those who are dead in trespasses and sin would be made alive by the power of your spirit and brought to repentance by your word. We pray that your grace would strengthen us, build us up, all who truly profess the Christian faith, that we would be a holy people set apart, not only to hear your word, Lord, but to do it too. Open our eyes to see you and our hearts to know you and our minds to understand you this morning. We pray this in the name of our Lord, your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our first opening hymn of praise this morning is number 296, found in the Trinity Hymnal. We'll be singing verses 1, 3, 5, and 6. responsive reading this morning, taken from Psalm 65. 
By awesome deeds you answer us with righteousness, O God of our salvation. The hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farther seas. The one who by his strength established the mountains, being girded with might. <laughs> You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide their grain, for so you have prepared it. You water its furrows abundantly, settling its ridges, softening it with showers, and blessing its growth. Our hymn of praise this morning is Though Troubles Assail Us. You can find that in your Trinity hymnal, number 95. We'll sing verses 1, 3, and 4. Thank you. Please be seated. As we do every Lord's Day, we come into the Lord's presence aware of our sin. We do not come lightly into the presence of a holy God or into his sanctuary. And so at this time, I invite you to join me in our unison confession of sin found in your bulletin. Saying together, Almighty God, we confess how hard it is to be your people. You have called us to be the church, to continue the mission of Jesus Christ to our lonely and confused world. Yet we acknowledge we are more apathetic than active, isolated than involved, callous than compassionate, obstinate than obedient, legalistic than loving. Gracious Lord, have mercy upon us and forgive our sins. Remove the obstacles preventing us from being your representatives to a broken world. Awaken our hearts to the promised gift of your influence spirit. This we pray in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. I invite you now to enter into a moment of silent confession of sin.
debt to you, our sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. We confess here to you those things that we have done and left undone, those thoughts that we have thought and left unthought, the things that we have said and left unsaid. By omission or commission, Lord, we present our sins to you and confess them and seek forgiveness in Jesus' name. Brothers and sisters, hear the words of assurance from Romans chapter 10, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is good news. Amen. As we confess our sin, we also profess our faith. And so I invite you at this moment to uh, cite the Apostles' Creed as a confession of what we do believe. Found on page 845 of the Trinity Hymnal, I invite you to stand as we confess our faith. <laughs> Saying together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. And is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the last. Amen. Our hymn of response this morning is Jesus, What a Friend for Sinners, found on 498 in the Trinity Hymnal.
Our Old Testament lesson, lesson this morning is taken from 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 8 through 23. You may be seated. Please follow along in your Bible, or there are pew Bibles to your left or right. Now the king of Aram was warring against Israel, and he counseled with his servant, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God sent word to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Arameans are coming down there. And the king of Israel sent to the place about which the man of God had told him. Thus he warned him, so that he guarded himself there more than once or twice. Then the heart of the king of Aram was enraged over this thing, and he called his servants and said to them, Will you not tell me? Which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, No, my lord, O king. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. So he said, Go and see where he is, that I may send and take him. And it was told to him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. So he sent horses and chariots and a heavy military force there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. Then the attendant of the man of God arose early and went out, and behold, a military force with horses and chariots was all around the city. And his young man said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he said, Do not fear. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Yahweh, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And Yahweh opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And they came down to him and Elisha prayed to Yahweh and said, Strike this people with blindness, I pray. So he struck them with blindness, according to the word of Elisha. Then Elisha said to them, This is not the way, and this is not the city. Walk after me, and I will walk you over to the man whom you seek. And he walked them over to Samaria. Now it happened that when they had come into Samaria, Elisha said, O Yahweh, open the eyes of these men that they may see. So Yahweh opened their eyes, and they saw. And behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. Then the king of Israel, when he saw them, said to Elisha, My father, shall I strike them down? Shall I strike them down? And he said, You shall not strike them down. Would you strike down those you have taken captive by your sword and with your bow? Set bread and water before them, that they may eat and drink and walk back to their master. So he prepared a great feast for them. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away. And they went to their master. And the marauding bands of Arameans did not come again into the land of Israel. This is the word of the Lord.
Well, as Elder Williams noted at the beginning of the service this morning, we are continuing in Pastor Nate's sermon series, uh, which was planned several months ago, from the Gospel of John titled, That You May Be One. We're looking at the farewell discourse of Jesus to his disciples, and it's a discourse full both of difficult truths and realities and great comforts. Ultimately, it's leading to Jesus, uh, what was called his high priestly prayer in John 17, where Jesus prays for a unity among his flock that is likened to the unity of the Trinity, which is really an astonishing prayer by Jesus for his people. So we'll be looking at that together in the coming weeks, but today we are picking up where we left off in John chapter 15, uh, beginning in verse 18 through verse 4 of the following chapter. You can follow along in your Bible or a pew Bible, and as you are able, I invite you to stand for the reading of God's word. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you, that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your word, the difficult truths that lie therein, and yet the great comfort that we have by it and by your spirit. Would you open our eyes and our minds to see you, open our ears to hear you, in our minds to understand and to know this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. So, similar to uh, many boys my age, when I was a little kid, I was infatuated with superheroes. The legends of the modern day would stir my imagination. What would it be like to have larger-than-life heroes who fought the good fight, who stood up to evil in the face of overwhelming odds, whose superior strength and character would ultimately win the day? I think I liked it because superheroes made me feel courageous. I remember if I watched a great superhero movie, I would go outside and imagine I had those powers. I had the courage to fight the bad guys. I was able to borrow their strength, at least in my imagination to defeat whatever enemy might fictitiously come my way. And the thing that I've learned about superheroes over the years is that the way they begin determines who they finally become. The end is in the beginning, as my friend Dr. Bennett often says. That's why every good superhero has an origin story. It all begins somewhere. There are crucial moments of loss or trial or decision which culminate in something new. It forms something that hadn't been there before, a determination or a character or a heart that is bound to some new mission, to save others or to stop evil, to sacrifice themselves on behalf of the world. Well, don't make fun of me, but one of my favorite modern origin stories is Captain America, as portrayed in the 2011 film, The First Avenger. I don't endorse the the, uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe, but this origin story uh, spoke to me. It spoke to me because Steve Rogers was the unlikeliest of heroes. 
He was the epitome of an underdog, a short and skinny runt of a young man who tries to falsify his medical records in order to enlist in the infantry, but they routinely deny him. He's asthmatic, he's too small, this isn't gonna work. I found, perhaps, an affinity for Rogers because even though I was generally tall for my age, I was a skinny runt of a boy myself when I was young. But Rogers is introduced to the audience. We see him as someone who stands up to bullies. He doesn't like bullies. He's always bigger than, the, uh, than he is, and he's losing fights in back alleys. Uh, he stands up on his principles, and he gets punched in the face. As one bully pauses from pummeling him, he says, you just don't know when to give up, do you? And Rogers famous catchphrase is born, I could do this all day. <laughs> so when the Nazis come onto the stage in World War II, Rogers is constitutionally drawn to try and enter that fight. He wants to fight the bigger bullies. He cannot stand it when bullies are allowed to rule. The problem, however, is obvious. A runt who can't win a back alley fight is of no use in real warfare. Though his zeal is strong, his frame is weak and insufficient. His courage simply does not align with his ability to deliver. Enter Dr. Erskine and Colonel Phillips, scientist and soldier. In this story, the doctor finds Steve Rogers as he is recruiting for his new super soldier program. Uh, he invites Rogers to enter basic training, and the doctor and the colonel are arguing about who should be the first recruit to enter the trial. The colonel wants a good soldier who is already strong and can follow orders. But the doctor knows that his serum enhances everything within a man. Good becomes great, bad becomes worse. For the colonel, the perfect soldier is first a good soldier. But for the doctor, the perfect soldier is first a good man. And our video clip this morning will demonstrate, uh, it picks up right there. Stick a needle in that kid's arm, it's gonna go right through him. Come on, girls. <laughs> Look at that. He's making me cry. I am looking for qualities beyond the physical. Do you know how long it took to set up this project? Yeah, All know. the groveling I had to do in front of Senator What's-His-Name's committees. Yes, I know. I am well aware of your efforts. Then throw me a bone. Hodge passed every test we gave him. He's big, he's fast, he obeys orders, he's a soldier. He's a bully. You don't win wars with niceness, doctor. Win wars with guts. Grenade! Oh, oh, Get away! Get back! Dummy grenade. All clear. Back in formation. Is this a test? He's still skinny. You don't win wars with niceness, doctor. You win wars with guts. The colonel is not fooled. He looks at this skinny boy and doesn't see what he wants to see. He knows warfare is not for the faint of heart and he will not countenance weakness in his soldiers. He's looking for a strength on the outside and he's rightly looking for a corresponding obedience Obey orders. But the colonel is not able to perceive beyond obedience to what is in the heart of a man. So the colonel creates a moment of decision. He pressurizes the situation. And when the grenade is tossed with seconds to react, everyone flees, except Rogers. And in that moment, in the moment of decision with just a few seconds to react, Rogers' true strength is actually revealed. His courage to move towards danger his willingness to sacrifice himself, his worthiness to be followed. What comes out in the moment of decision is a magnified version of what was there all along. It wasn't created in that moment, but it was born. And so the famed Captain America comes into being, not when he's endowed with strength beyond his ability later on, but at the moment he was willing to die. And because he was willing to die in the right way, at the right time, for the right reason, strength and authority flow to him beyond his natural abilities, a strength that would match the strength of his heart. Of course, Rogers is a fiction. This is just a superhero movie. But that moment, that moment is real, the moment of decision. 
And Rogers demonstrates in that movie what our big idea is for the text this morning, that when we are pushed to our limits, our hearts are revealed. Limits reveal loves. When Jesus speaks to his disciples in John 15, he is speaking to his friends. In the verses leading up to our passage, Christ says, No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. And he says that greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. As he commands them to love one another, Jesus tells them that what they most deeply love will be revealed in the moments of greatest peril. Our limits reveal our loves. When all else seems lost, where will we find the anchor? When there seems to be no way out, will our hearts grow faint? When we are pushed to our outermost limit, what is revealed? The disciples are afraid. Throughout this entire discourse, John 14 through 17, Jesus is constantly comforting his disciples while also giving them terrible news, very afraid, uh, making them very afraid. In John 14, three times he says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. I will not leave you as orphans, he says. I will come to you. Do not let your hearts be afraid. He says this because Jesus knows that very often our loves are actually revealed by our fears. What we fear losing is often what reveals where our heart resides. And he's bringing the disciples to the sobering moment of fear. He's pressurizing the situation by letting them know what will come. It's a gut check, a dose of reality. This is the cost of discipleship, and the world will likely hate you. It is not a small thing. Notice how Jesus says this at the beginning of our text this morning. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. It's an if clause. He's not saying it absolutely definitely will happen, but it's a pretty, it's a, it's a very likely scenario. So don't be surprised when that moment comes. He follows it with another if clause. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, because I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. The word for love here is the kind of fraternal love between friends. If you came from the world, Jesus says, you, you could be friends with the world. But because I have chosen you out of the world, the world rejects you because the world rejects what I have chosen. James tells us something similar, but from the opposite side. He says, friendship with the world is enmity with God. And whoever wishes to be called a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. That's what Jesus is saying. He's telling his disciples, you can't be friends with God and friends with the antithesis of God at the same time. It doesn't mean you can't learn to love the world, as he has called us to do. We'll talk about that later. But it does mean that the world will, by nature, hate and reject you. Jesus goes on to say, remember the word that I have said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If it happened to me, it's going to happen to you. It's pretty simple. We read in the, our Old Testament reading this morning about the chariots of fire. When real chariots had been arrayed against the people, do you ever feel like the weight of the whole world is arrayed against you? In that moment, where is your heart? What is it that you fear? Do you ever feel like you are persecuted for no reason? In that moment, how do you respond? What is it that you seek to protect the most? What do your limits reveal? Jesus warns his disciples ahead of time, don't be afraid when the fight is bigger than you because the fight is always bigger than you. That's the point, that's the gospel. You can't handle the problem on your own. You can't handle the problem of your own heart and the sin that is within you, much less the whole world. The problem is always bigger than you are. But Jesus can handle it. Jesus has already handled it. If the world looks at you and hates you, know that it hated him first. Jesus says, I've chosen you out of the world. You don't belong there. The world cannot love you because it does not love me. 
but I do not leave you alone. Take heart. The fight is bigger than you, but I am bigger than the fight. In fact, before Abraham was, I am. I am existence itself. So in the moment of trial, in that moment of distress, when we are pushed to our limits, we need to take note of our hearts. Take note of our fears. As you approach the edge and you look over, what is it that you see? What is your limit revealing about your loves? Briefly, before moving on, it's probably worth noting what Jesus is not saying in this passage so we don't misunderstand. That is, if the world hates you, that alone is not proof enough that you're living in a Christ-like way. Hatred and a persecution on account of Christ's name qualifies Christian suffering. If the world hates you for doing hateful things, that's called justice. But if the world hates you for proclaiming Christ and him crucified, then you are suffering for his name and you are blessed. Likewise, the other way around, if the, in the event that the world does hate you for following Christ, we then have, we have no recourse to turn and hate the world back. There is no justification for forsaking our Christian mission. Quite the opposite. What Jesus tells us in this passage is that our job in the midst of this kind of opposition and hatred is to bear witness to him. Bearing witness to Christ means living as martyrs. What do I mean by this? Well, the word for bear witness is martureo, from where our English word martyr comes. It means to testify, to bear witness to something. In our passage, Jesus says the Spirit will bear witness to us about him, and that we also will bear witness about him to the world. Jesus is calling us to a life of bearing witness, which is a life of martyrdom. The primary reason for the world's rejection is that the world does not know the Father. They do not know him who sent me. And whoever hates me hates my father also. This is to fulfill what is written in the law, that they hated me without a cause. Jesus is quoting here from Psalm 69, whose opening lines say, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters and the floods sweep over me. I am weary with my crying out. My throat is parched. My eyes grow dim with waiting for my God. More in number than the hairs of my head are those who hate me without cause. Mighty are those who would destroy me, those who attack me with lies. What I did not steal must I now restore? O oh God, you know my folly. The wrongs I have done are not hidden from you. These are not slight or minced words. These are words of suffering and oppression and enemies at the gates. Jesus is saying that this unjustified hatred is being fulfilled in him. And if it happened to him, it will likely happen to us. But he goes on to say that we are not left alone. We have a helper. Literally, what that word means is one who calls or names. We are called by name to witness to Christ by the Spirit, not in our own strength not in our own power, but by the Holy Spirit that proceeds from the Father. And this is not something we do in isolation either. Our modern English often obscures this because we have no distinction between the second in person plural and singular. They're both you. If I say you, I love you. Do, you, do, you know, do I mean one of you or all of you? Well, all 33 times in this passage, you is plural. Every time Jesus is speaking to his disciples, to his friends, he's speaking to them as the collective. If we were all Southern, it'd be easier. We could say y'all, and then everybody would know. I refuse to go Pittsburgh and say yins. It's just, doesn't seem right. But I'm a transplant, so. The point is, it's clear in Scripture, the Holy Spirit transforms us personally. As believers, our hearts are transformed and renewed by the Spirit who brings us to faith in Christ and ultimately brings us to the Father. We are transformed from the inside out. But simultaneously, we are called to corporately bear witness. We bear witness in a life of martyrdom by the Spirit together. He's our helper. It means that we do not do this merely in isolation. We do this collectively. It's certainly no less than personal transformation of the heart, but it is meant to grow beyond the boundaries of our individual lives. I think this is difficult for our modern context for a lot of reasons. 
we're used to curating our lives in such a way that we kind of filter out as much as we don't want to see or hear as possible. And that creates two illusions for us. The first is that we believe we have far more control than we actually do. We don't have that much control. And the second is that we believe we can exist in separation from one another more than we actually can. For instance, though we confess with our mouths that God is sovereign and Jesus is Lord, that's right and good to do, do our actions and words, do our loves as revealed in the moments of our limits actually reveal this to be true? What is our witness? How often do we technically profess faith in Christ, but functionally live as if we are God, like we are sovereign? Paul describes the Christian life in Romans 12 in a similar way, that we should be a living sacrifice, our bodies presented in worship to God, that our witness and evangelism and testimony is our manner of life, right up to and maybe even including the point of death. This happens on a daily and personal level in the heart but it also must happen among us as a body of believers. Though each of us indeed may genuinely profess faith in Christ, do we corporately bear witness about him to the watching world? How do we bear witness together with one another in moments of trial? Do we treat our faith as a private reality that I have to myself or as a cosmic reality? When Jesus says the world will hate you, the word for world is cosmos. Christ is king of the cosmos because the cosmos was made through him and for him. But because of sin, the cosmos has arrayed itself against him and therefore against us. So how do we respond? We are bound to Christ, but we are also bound to one another because we are Christ's body. And likewise, because of sin, Christ's own body at times will array itself against him. That's what Jesus is getting at in our passage. He tells us ahead of time not to be surprised when things get difficult, even in the church. For the hour will come, he says, when they will put you out of the synagogues, and when whoever kills you will think he is offering a service to God. How can that be? Does it really have to be like this, Jesus? I struggled mightily through this part of the passage in particular this week knowing where we are as a congregation. And so I did a lot of reading. I sought what wise men who have come before me have said upon this passage. And as I read through commentaries and sermons, I found Martin Luther's words on this part of John 16 particularly poignant. He puts it this way. Not only does Christ exhort and command the disciples, but he also comforts them. His words apply to all the world, He says, I am repeating this commandment that you love one another because you, my apostles and disciples, will encounter enmity also among you and from your own people. You will be taken aback and say, I surely expected to find nothing but love and unity among us as our gospel teaches. Whence then comes such division, discord, hatred, and hostility? Therefore, I am telling you this, that you may know it in advance and adjust yourselves to this condition, If you want to be my disciples, submit to it and become reconciled to the fact that it will not be otherwise. As long as you so turn here, you will be and remain exposed to the hatred of the world. Therefore, see to it that you cling to one another all the more firmly through love. Do not be frightened or torn away from me, even though you forfeit the favor and the affection of the world and must give up many friends. For my sake. That last part, I think, is worth repeating. Therefore, see to it that you cling to one another all the more firmly through love. Do not be frightened or torn away from me, even though you forfeit the favor and the affection of the world and must give up many friends for my sake. Martyrdom is a high price to pay. It is the greatest price. And yet Jesus tells us this is also what the greatest love looks like. That we are ready to lay down our lives for our friends. To be ready to give up everything to bear witness to Christ. To be bound to him and to one another. 
I have said all these things to keep you from falling away, Jesus says. Hold fast to me. Hold fast to the Spirit who calls you by name. He will remind you that you belong to me. When we are pushed to our limit, we must die to ourselves, that we may live to Christ and to one another. That is the message of a martyr, of one who bears witness. The Spirit who calls you to give up your comforts and your wants and your priorities, to be taken to the limit and face your fears, and then to lay them down at the foot of the cross, that your life would bear witness to the one who not only overcomes the world, but saves the world because he loves the world. The world hates you because it hates Christ. But fear not, you have been chosen out of the world to witness back to the world from the outside. You endure the hatred of the world that you may learn to love the world as Christ does. And as we are united to him, we are united to one another, bearing witness against every attack. The old hymn states it well. They will know we are Christians by our love. This is the gospel. Christ loves you. Hear him say, I love you. We are his bride. We are his beloved. We are his church. And in the moment of decision, in the moment of greatest peril, he revealed his heart for us. He demonstrated the Father's love for us. When he reached his limits of human nature at Gethsemane, when the will of the Father was to not have the cup pass from his hand, the love of God was revealed in Christ who died for his beloved on the cross. He died for you because he loves you. He died in the right way at the right time for the right reason so you might live. This is what binds us to God and to one another. Believe. Believe that your life would bear witness Today's takeaway is that question. What do your limits reveal? When we see that grenade roll towards us, what will be revealed? What comes out of us is what's already inside of us. What we have practiced in small ways and back alleys will be magnified on the battlefield. What we have habituated into, into our living rooms is how we will abide in worship, in the sanctuary. How we approach our dinner table is how we're going to approach the Lord's table. How are you preparing for that moment? Where are you right now, already living as a martyr? What will you do in your moment of decision? And what will your limits reveal about your heart? The invitation of Christ is here, and it's clear. Don't be afraid of the battle. It's bigger than you. But trust in Christ who has already, already won the war. Don't be afraid of the world. It will hate you. Believe in Jesus who has already overcome the world. And don't run from the call of martyrdom. It is the life of one who bears witness. When all else seems to fail, we hold fast to him and to one another. United in witness against the world for the sake of the world because we have learned to love the world through Jesus Christ, our Lord, and to the glory of God the Father. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do indeed come to you knowing that the world itself often arrays against us. The fight is bigger than we are, and at times we are afraid, so afraid that we do not know how to take the next step. Lord, help us to trust you, to know that the helper whom you have given to us speaks to us by name, to remind us of whose we are, that we have been chosen out of the world to follow you, to bear witness to you, that we would be your body, your bride, your church. Help us to know this now and grow in it every day, that when the moment of decision comes, Lord, we would bear witness to you that our limits would reveal a heart transformed and in love with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, I invite the ushers to come forward to receive this morning's offering.
Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we give back to you what you have first given to us. Thank you for the many ways that you have blessed us in our individual lives and our lives as a church family. We humbly give back to you that as an offering, both with our time and our talents and our treasure, but our very hearts, Lord, we give it back to you, for you have first given us life and breath. Receive it, Lord, and may it be abundantly sown to produce more fruit than it seems possible to do. We pray this in your name. Please stand as we sing the threefold Amen, found on page 740 of the Trinity Hymnal. from one who is authorized to do so. But I can speak to you the words from Romans 15, verses 5 through 7. So hear these words from our Lord. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Jesus Christ, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. <laughs>